movement in the church. And with all these competing voices, it's easy to see how at times we can be plagued by questions like, is what I believe really true? How do I know that I'm pleasing God? Am I even a Christian? What are the marks of a genuine follower of Jesus? Well, today we're beginning a series on 1 John. It's a letter found in the New Testament that addresses many of these questions and provides comfort to those of us who've ever struggled with them. Now, 1 John is a letter written by John, the son of Zebedee, one of Jesus' apostles, and it's written to a congregation located in the city of Ephesus, which is in what is today modern Turkey, sometimes known as Asia Minor. And according to some scholars, now, Ephesus was a geographical heart, the geographical heart of a Christian community that had grown up around the Apostle John. They also included uh, house churches, kind of like our kinship groups. Sociologist Rodney Stark points out that Ephesus was most famous as the center of Diana worship. Uh, it boasted her sanctuary, uh, and with 128 pillars, each 60 feet high, the temple was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it attracted people from all over the Mediterranean world. Now, in addition to the lucrative tourist business from pilgrims to the temple, commerce, trade guilds, and banking made Ephesus one of the preeminent cities in Asia Minor. Some scholars estimate that its population could have been as high as 200,000. Now, John's writing to a congregation of people who have some doubts as to whether they're on the right track. They've experienced an event that's greatly affected the church, and they're recovering from a very difficult, confusing, and heartbreaking situation. So John writes to encourage them and assure them that God still loves them. And yes, they haven't believed in vain. They're on the right track. Now, before we jump in, I wanted to say a word about the letters that we find in the New Testament, because the New Testament is comprised of uh, various types of documents, and most of them tend to be what we would refer to as letters. And so, I wanted to just make a, a, say a brief word about the letters that we find in the New Testament. By and large, they're letters written to churches struggling with specific problems. They're not theology textbooks systematically going point by point through Christian doctrine. They're written to address specific needs, specific situations in congregations just like ours. And in order to fully appreciate what God is saying through these letters to us, we first have to understand what God was saying to the particular congregations to which they were originally addressed. So this means figuring out the particular issues that they were dealing with, they were struggling with. And this can be difficult because it's like you're listening to a friend talking to somebody on a cell phone. You're, we're only hearing one side of the conversation. And so what we have to do is kind of reconstruct the situation in that particular church that God was addressing, God's word was addressing for that particular congregation. And the key to understanding 1 John, understanding what the congregation is struggling with, is found not at the beginning of the letter, but rather in chapter 2. So we're going to begin our series on 1 John there, because it will give us the key to understanding the letter as a whole. And so we'll be reading from 1 John, chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And so if you have your Bible or your Bible app, you can follow along, or we'll also have the scripture up on the, the screens and, and the walls. So John writes, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as, if you, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have come. And this is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit, and all of you know the truth. 
I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Wow, big passage, a lot in there. Let's see if we can begin to unpack this and see what light it sheds on what's just happened in the church at Ephesus. John writes in verse 18, Dear children, this is the last hour. As New Testament scholar Donald Burdick points out, what the other New Testament writers um, and John, oh, he points out that uh, with the other New Testament writers, John viewed the whole period beginning with Christ's first coming as the last days. They understood this to be the, the last of the days because neither former prophecy nor new revelation concerning the history of salvation indicated the coming of another era before the return of Christ. He continues, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Now both the book of Revelation and Paul's second letter to the church in the Greek city of Thessalonica assert that a great enemy of God's people would arise to persecute the church and lead people astray, lead them away from the truth until finally Jesus would return and destroy his power. The prefix anti, from the Greek, before the word Christ signifies that this person is against Christ. John goes on to assert that just as there will eventually arise this chief enemy of Christ and his people, that in fact there are already many little antichrists, as it were, in the world. There were many people, he's saying, there are many people, he's saying, who actively oppose Christ and seek to lead people astray. Let's go on to verse 19. He says, this is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. What's he saying? He's saying that there's been a church split. He's writing to a church where presumably a significant portion of the <coughs> congregation has left. And he describes the members of this group as people who will oppose Christ and says in verse 26 that they're trying to lead those who have remained in the church, trying to lead them astray. He writes in verse 22, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. So this group that has left the church is denying Christ. But what does John mean by this? What does it mean to deny Christ for John in this instance? Well, he gives us a clue in chapter 4. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, he writes, This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So this group, and presumably its leaders, are teaching that Jesus really didn't come in the flesh. And he really didn't die on the cross. He only appeared to die. And this was a, a belief common to one of early Christianity's chief competitors, a movement called Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that the world and matter were bad. It had been created, they'd been created by a lesser God. And the greater God existed in a realm of heavenly life, way, he heavenly light, way, way up there. People possessed a divine spark within themselves. They just didn't know it. 
And so salvation, therefore, came not from having one's sins forgiven by Jesus' death on the cross, but by receiving special knowledge. Gnostic, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word for knowledge. Um, so salvation came by receiving special knowledge that enabled you to realize that in fact you had this spark of divinity living within you. And so through that knowledge, you were able, the whole purpose in life was to enable that spark of divinity to escape the bonds of flesh and your body and matter and return back to the realm of light from which it had originally come. Now because Gnostics, the Gnostics believed that matter was bad, again, some taught that Jesus' humanity was only a disguise. He wasn't really human. Others taught that the Christ Spirit joined Jesus at his baptism and then left him when he was on the cross. Now, although Gnosticism, uh, as a full-blown movement, didn't develop until several decades after John's time, this letter that he had written, it appears that the ideas, their ideas, were already beginning to circulate in Ephesus. One of the earliest leaders of the church, in fact, in the generation following that of the apostles, a man named Ignatius, uh, wrote a letter to this same church in Ephesus 25 years later, and where he, even in that letter, he's continuing, he warns them against the Gnostics. So presumably this group that had left the church was still around 25 years later. And by that time, had grown into full-blown Gnosticism. So on top of the heartbreak of having friends and people they worshipped with leave the church, the people who stayed are now being accused of having the wrong ideas about Jesus. Those who've left are saying, in essence, that they're not really Christians. And so John is writing to encourage those who stayed that they are true Christians. And in the process, he talks about the characteristics of a genuine follower of Christ. He also wants to comfort and reassure them that despite the hardship they've been through, that God really does love them. So if you want to understand the letter of 1 John, that is what you need to know. That's the overall purpose and background of 1 John. So how does John respond to the accusations of these early Gnostics? One, by reassuring those who stayed in the church that what they believe about Jesus is true. They have God's Spirit living in them, and therefore, they don't need to listen to the new gospel being preached by these false teachers. This is why he writes, again in verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit, and all of you know the truth. I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. And he continues in verse 27, As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that comes to live in Christians and people when they give their life over to Jesus. He also goes on to emphasize the trustworthiness of what he and the other apostles teach concerning Jesus. That Jesus really was a human being, and he really did come in the flesh. This is why at the very beginning of the letter, in chapter 1, verse 1, John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our ears have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. See, the teaching of John and the other apostles is true because they were with Jesus, and they were with Jesus in person. And they listened to him, and they saw him, and they actually touched him. Jesus was really flesh and bone. So John also asserts in chapter 2, verse 2, that Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So in contrast to the assertion of the false teachers, Christ actually died on the cross, and it's that act that heals our relationship with God, not realizing our own divinity. So what does this mean for us? How, you know, what, what is God's word to us today in this letter that was written 2,000 years ago? Well, as I stated at the beginning of my sermon, we live in a time where increasingly as a culture, there's no longer a consensus on what's true. We're fast becoming a post-Christian culture. 
with the exception of the New Age movement, <coughs> there are not a lot of voices in our culture, at least, urging that Jesus was only a phantom, that he didn't really die on the cross. But there are many that insist that he was just a great moral teacher, one of the greatest in history, in fact, but not the unique Son of God. And there are many people who deny that his death on the cross had any effect whatsoever. Now, even within the church, beliefs that have been considered orthodox from the very beginning are now being questioned. Uh, we're being urged to tone down our insistence on the uniqueness of Christ. We're already seen as too judgmental by the culture, the argument goes. And so insisting that Jesus is the unique Son of God and the only way to a relationship with God is only going to make matters worse and turn people off even further to the church. Now in order to survive and attract an increasingly skeptical population, we're told we should tone it down. Sometimes, in the face of this increasing skepticism, we can doubt whether what we believe is in fact true, whether Jesus is in fact unique. The message of 1 John to us is a ringing affirmation of Christianity's insistence that Jesus Christ is the unique Son of God, who came in the flesh as a human being like us, and whose death on the cross has wiped away our sins and provided a way back to our Heavenly Father. It's, the, it, it, its message is that, is that Jesus isn't a, a mythological figure. He's a real historical person who lived 2,000 years ago in Israel and whose death on the cross was the defining moment in all of history. And it exhorts us not to lessen our belief in this, but in fact says it's our very insistence on holding to this belief in the face of opposition that proves we are in fact children of God and true followers of Christ. It also reminds us that false movements, counterfeit Christianities, will always present a different Jesus than the one presented in the Gospels. If you're wondering whether a movement is in fact Christian, all you've got to do is look at what they say about Jesus. Take Mormonism, for instance. The Mormon Church teaches that Jesus is a pre-existent spirit who is the brother of Satan. And according to one of its founders, Brigham Young, Jesus' death on the cross was not sufficient to forgive all sins. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus is merely an angel. So the mark of Orthodox Christianity, and therefore genuine followers of Jesus, is that they affirm that Jesus was the unique Son of God who came in the flesh, whose death on the cross reconciled us to God, and who rose from the dead. I wanted to end by recounting an event from the history of America that should encourage all of us to remain faithful in our insistence that Christ is the only way and to proclaim it unapologetically, even in the face of a culture that's increasingly hostile to Jesus' claims. Sociologist of religion Philip Jenkins points out that 200 years ago, the church in America was in an almost identical situation to the one it's in today. He writes, quote, in 18th century America, secular enlightenment ideas made enormous progress among social elites. Few traditional bastions of Christian belief escaped attack. The Trinity, the divinity of Christ, the existence of hell, all fell into disfavor, while academic biblical scholarship undermined the familiar basis of faith. Thomas Jefferson was, Jefferson was confident that rational Unitarianism was destined to be the dominant creed of the United States. Unitarianism taught that Jesus was merely a good teacher, and it denied all of the supernatural aspects of Christianity. In fact, at this time, many of the largest churches uh, in cities like Boston and New York were Unitarian. Many of the leading members uh, of society attended these churches. 
Thomas Jefferson, in fact, was, went so far as to predict in 1822, quote, I trust there is not a young man living in the United States who will not die a Unitarian. And he predicted, quote, the present generation will see Unitarianism become the general religion of the United States. As Jenkins so aptly puts it, quote, any knowledgeable, any knowledgeable observer, any rational, educated person in the 1790s would have concluded that Orthodox Christianity had reached its last days. See, many people, particularly on the conservative side of the spectrum, have kind of this, this golden view, you know, this rosy view of the way things were in the past. We think, you know, 1700s founding fathers, everybody was Christian. No, actually, the prevailing view among the, the, the influence makers was against Christianity. As Jenkins so absolutely puts it, I'll read that again, any knowledgeable observer in the 1790s would have concluded that Orthodox Christianity had reached its last days. And yet the President of the United States saying, oh, Christian in a generation, Christianity will have disappeared. And Unitarianism will be the prevailing view of the land. Today, only one-tenth of one percent of the population of the United States are members of the Unitarian Church. While the percentage of Americans who identify as Orthodox Christians is around 69 percent. See, once again, all of the smartest people in the 1700s and the early 1800s who said Christianity had to get with the times and change its message were proven wrong. I'm reminded of Harvard professor Harvey Cox in 1966 convinced that an inevitable process of secularization had begun that it ensured Christianity's demise. He was one of a small group of influential theologians who declared that God was dead. That was actually the cover of Time Magazine uh, in 1966. Barely 30 years later, however, Cox had completely changed his tune and was promoting himself as an expert on the worldwide growth of Christianity and admitting that it was one of the fastest growing movements in the world. I love that. Just, 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 just ponder the irony of that for me. <laughs> When Jesus asked Peter in Matthew 16 who he thought he was, Peter declared, you are the Christ, the Holy One of God. Jesus responded, you are Peter, and on this rock, on this affirmation that I am the Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This has been the ringing affirmation of the church throughout the centuries. It's the same message the Apostle Paul, John had for the group of Christians meeting in Ephesus all those years ago. And it's the mark of all true followers of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that your truth will have out that at the end of the day you will show the wisdom of your truth. You will show that, that what has been proclaimed about your son Jesus is true. Thank you, Father, that that proclamation will, um, that, that the gates of hell will not be able to stand against that proclamation from the advance of your church. Thank you for what you did for us in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can experience freedom. We can experience uh, a new start. Thank you that there's life in that. That it's true that, that there are those of us today here who experience that. I just want to encourage you, if you are here today and, and you don't really know what you think about Jesus, or you just think, you know, it's just superstition, uh, I just want to encourage you to um, take the time to, to ask somebody here, maybe some, there may be someone in your life who, um, who has 
given their life over to Jesus and does believe that he was different and unique, I would encourage you to sit down with them or, and just ask them, well, you know, what difference has Christ made in your life? Because one of the reasons that we know, one of the reasons I know that Jesus is unique is because of the, the change he's made in my life. He made an everlasting change in my life, completely shook my life to its found, very foundations. And he gave me a hope, there, a peace and a hope and a purpose and a joy came into my life when I opened it up to Jesus that I didn't have before then. So I just want to again encourage you, Holy Spirit, pray that you would come and be at work and, and just be moving on people's hearts. If there's somebody here who has doubts, pray that you just speak to them. Some of you may have heard of Blaise Pascal, the famous French mathematician. Um, there's something famous, but it's known as Pascal's wager. And he said, the wager is this. If you believe that God exists, and you get to the end of your life and you die, and you find that he did exist, you've gained everything. But if you don't believe he, you live your life as though he does not exist, and you get to the end of your life and you die and you realize that he does exist, you've lost everything. Got that? I missed the first part of that. Try that again. He believed, what he said was, look, if you believe God exists, you get the end of your life, you die, and he doesn't exist, you haven't lost anything, right? But if you, if you live your life as though he didn't exist, and you get to the end of your life and you die, and you find he did exist, then you've lost everything. Sorry for flubbing that. But that's Pascal's wager. So Father, um, help us. Lord, we want to be uh, witnesses to this generation of the difference that Jesus Christ makes. I want to be a people who reflects his character. We were different. People can look at us. I was talking to somebody last night who's kind of on this whole journey of faith. And, uh, you know, he's at a point where he still kind of has some doubts about Jesus and who he is and, and kind of, you know, did, did he really, did, did his dying on the cross really do what the Bible said it did? But his comment was, you know what, though? I've bought into the community. I've bought in. I've recognized the fact that Christians are are the most enjoyable, fun, exciting people to be around. And so I think it would be a big step for us as a body if we could, as a community, more and more, as we profess Christ, that he's the only way, if we could more and more reflect his love and his joy and his peace. This is very attractive. I know that's one of the things that attracted me. So again, if you have any questions, you want to ask some questions about Jesus, or you know, I would say after the service today, grab somebody in the seat next to you. You can ask them. They, they may be in the same boat you're in. That's okay. Then you can both go find somebody and ask them. Or you can come, you know, certainly talk to me um, afterwards as well. So um, I also wanted to, to end too by you can you pray, Father. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> that was a long prayer, wasn't it? <laughs> so, some of you may have heard of this book. It's written by a journalist, a um, man named Lee Strobel. And it's called the, the Case for Christ. And so, he was an agnostic. He's a prominent journalist. was an agnostic and kind of set about saying, okay, I'm going to as a professional reporter and as a researcher, I'm going to look into this man, Jesus. And I'm going to do my very best to as thoroughly as possible find as much as I can about this man and the claims that he made. And so I want to encourage you, if you're at a point where you're wondering about Jesus or if you're, you know, or you know somebody in your life who has some doubts or you... I would strongly encourage you to pick up a copy of this book. We actually are going to have copies um, out in the foyer there on the right. And if you didn't bring money today, just grab a copy and you can always just, you know, 
pay us back later. Or if you don't have the money, just grab a copy and don't worry about it. Okay? But it's also a wonderful, as a belief,